Well, hello everybody, and welcome to the Cana Project. Welcome to our teaching tonight in the Word of God. My name is Robert, and you know, for the last few months, we have slowly been working our way through the Gospel according to Luke. That's been our, our study. Uh, we've, we've looked at the birth of Jesus, the events before His birth. We looked at His birth. Uh, we looked at, had a brief glimpse into His boyhood. We saw his inauguration into public ministry, his three years of preaching, teaching, miracles, and discipling of the Twelve. And then we've looked very carefully in the last few weeks at his arrest, his trial, and his crucifixion. <clears throat> and that's what we covered last week, his crucifixion. So at this point in our story, Jesus is dead. Uh, he is dead. His body is cold. There is no life in him. I don't know if you've ever seen a dead body of someone you've loved has passed away and you've been there, but there is a, a physical change in them where once there's life, all of a sudden, everything kind of sags and the lower, the upper lip kind of goes over the lower lip and they are dead. There is no life there. That is what happened to Jesus. And the same fate awaits all of us. All of us, at some point, unless the Lord returns first, will die. That's not a question. That is a fact. Death comes for us all. The question, the only question that must be answered is this. And how we answer this question that I'm about to ask or quote is indicated by how we live our lives. If I were to watch how you live your life, then I would know how you have answered this question that was posed by Job in the Old Testament. He asked this question over 3,000 years ago. And here it is, Job chapter 14, verse 14. If a man dies, will he live again? How you live your life will get, tells me the, your answer to that question. In, in the midst of incredible suffering, when life was just making no sense to Job, he's wondering, is this all there is? I lived my life, I tried to be a righteous man, and this is how I'm ending my life? Throughout the book of Job, he continually asked questions in his confusion. And you know what? Not one of Job's questions are answered in the book of Job. All that happens is God shows up finally and just says, I'm God. Do you trust me? But here's something very interesting. All of the questions that Job asked were ultimately answered in Jesus. For example, once Job asked the question, I, couldn't there be like an umpire between us, God? Somebody who would explain my case to you and explain you to me? Can't we have somebody? Well, that was answered in Jesus. He reveals the heart of the Father for us, which, by the way, is passionate love. He reveals the heart of the Father, and then He intercedes for us before the Father every day at the throne of grace. Cool, huh? Well, His question, if a man dies, will he live again, was answered in Jesus. It was answered once and for all when Jesus rose from the dead. So the Romans, <clears throat> the Jewish leaders, the curious crowds, and the disciples had watched Jesus die. They saw him take his last breath on the cross. Now, Rome did not make mistakes when it came to the cross. No one came off the cross alive, period. Darkness is falling late in the afternoon, early evening. The gospel tells us in John chapter 19, 31, now it was the day of preparation and the next day was a special Sabbath because the Jews did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath. They asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. And the soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus and then those of the other. But when they came to Jesus, they found that he was already dead. They did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. Now, forgive the graphic nature of what I'm about to unpack, but it's important to understand 
the purpose in the breaking of the legs of someone on a cross. After a while, what usually kills a person on the cross would be asphyxiation. They would suffocate. The reason is, as they lay forward with their hands nailed to the cross and the full weight on their chest, they took shallower and shallower breaths. Soon they could not get a breath. The only way that you could get a breath would be to push against your feet, which are nailed to the cross, push against them, get a breath, and buy yourself a few more minutes. This is what Jesus would do before every one of his seven utterances that we have recorded on the cross. Father, forgive them, they don't know what they do. A woman, behold your son, so on and so forth. He would push up and make his statement. Eventually, you, you, couldn't, you couldn't keep doing that, and eventually your full weight would fall forward, and you could not catch a breath. Eventually, you normally died of asphyxiation. So, to bring about quick death, which they needed to do because the Sabbath was about to begin, the Jewish leaders had requested, get these bodies down. They can't stay up there during the Sabbath. The Romans complied and sent soldiers to break the legs of Jesus and the two thieves that were next to him so that they would immediately die and then they could be taken down. Fulfilling one, no one comes off the cross alive and two, keeping the religious leaders happy. Now, <clears throat> they, they break first of all the leg of one of the thieves on the cross and he dies. Then they break the leg of the other, legs of the other thief and he dies. And um, I wonder why they left Jesus last. He had already made such a profound impression on them. I think they just, I just did. And so they come to Jesus and they look up and they see his, he's already dead. You can look at a person that has died and their, their chest is not moving, their face is, as it begins to change. They can see that he's dead, uh, by the way. And so they did not break his legs. By the way, this was an incredible fulfillment of the imagery that Jesus was fulfilling up there because one of the rules is the Passover lamb could not have a, any bones broken. It could be, have no mars, it could, had to be a perfect lamb, and it could not have any broken bones. And so here the lamb of God was not about to have his legs broken. He died. So, but they've got to ensure, they can't be fooled, Romans can't be fooled. And so one of the soldiers pokes him with a spear in the side. And the scriptures say, out of his side came wa water and blood. Water and blood. Um, now, this is another confirmation that Jesus was truly dead. When the accumulated blood in the chest cavity from hanging on the cross is now still, it no longer is moving, when it is still, blood begins to separate. And first, the heavier red blood cells will go to the bottom, and the lighter plasma, which is clear like water, will go to the top. And so, isn't this something? This, this, isn't this ironic? The Jewish leaders were using the Roman system to get their agenda accomplished, which was to get Jesus out of the way, get his teaching and himself off the map. But now God is using that same Roman system that says no one comes off the cross alive to underscore the fact that Jesus was dead so that when he rose from the dead three days later, there was no mistake. There was no confusion. God uses the Roman system so that the resurrection will be a complete victory over death, hell, and the grave. Our God is a mighty God. Don't ever get freaked out by the powers that be, Russia, United States, all of this stuff. All of that exists in the palm of God's hand, and God's will will be accomplished. There isn't anything that can stand against it. And when it's time, boom, we're with him, and everything here changes. You know, I've uh, read books in my lifetime, <laughs> believe it or not, I've read books in my life that, that, that espouse that one, Jesus never existed, but these are foolish books. I've read books that espouse that uh, he was a made-up character, 
or that he was just a regular guy and his followers after he died made up some stories about him so that they could stay in business, still take offerings and survive. But there's one theory that got some popularity when uh, in the 1970s, and that's when I first came across it, and what it espoused was what they called the swoon theory, that Jesus was overcome on the cross and just passed out. He was passed out. And so they took him off the cross. He really wasn't dead. He was passed out. And it got by the Romans. And then he was laid in the tomb. And the stone was put in front of the tomb. And the coolness of the tomb revived Jesus. And so he somehow got out of the tomb. They don't, they don't really explain that. But then when he had been so badly beaten that his disciples didn't recognize him. That's why they say they didn't, you know, in the... Uh, they think he was a gardener. They, they in the in John, I think, uh, his disciples at first didn't recognize him because he was so badly beaten. Now, I guess some people have bought that theory, but anybody that knows history knows that that is pure foolishness. The Roman system would not allow such foolishness. We have the incredible detail of the spear piercing his side and blood and water indicating he was truly dead pouring out now in the <clears throat> Jewish culture the dead were not buried in a grave like we do six foot under the ground you know or cremated uh, here's how it was intended to work the dead body of grandpa or grandma or mom or dad or a child was first of all cleaned washed cloths and cleaned then it was covered with sweet smelling oils and frankincense and myrrh were placed there in sweet smelling stuff was placed there in the linens and the body was wrapped up in a linen shroud then this linen wrapped body was placed in a tomb usually carved out of a hill on the side of a hill then a stone would be rolled in front of it, and the body would be left in that tomb for a year. During that year, all of the flesh, the muscle, the fat, everything would, would, would decay, be eaten uh, by, by uh, bugs and stuff like that, and uh, completely complete decay. So that after a year, you would have the linen wrapped around just pure bones just bones these bones would be gathered and placed in what is called an ossuary it's a box but no bigger than this wide the reason it was this wide it had our longest bone which is our femur from our knee to our hip that bone had to fit in there and so all the other bones were piled in there as well then this ossuary would be placed in a home covered and placed in a home in a garden a tomb uh, and those were those bones would lay awaiting the resurrection. Well, this is what you were going to do for Jesus. Sure, he had thought about resurrection. He was going to break the power of death. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, that was nice thoughts. But what we got on our hands is a dead body. And we need to treat this body like a like dead body like we treat dead bodies with honor. Um, but with the reality that it was going to decay. But this is what they would have done to Jesus... Uh, had he been uh, crucified on a Tuesday or a Wednesday. But because he was crucified on a Friday and at sunset the Sabbath would begin, they couldn't do that. And then uh, they couldn't even get, his disciples couldn't even get his body because a rich man, Joseph of Arimathea, went to the Romans and asked for the body. And he took it, wrapped it, and placed it in his unused tomb, the tomb that he had carved for himself that he had not used. And because the woman, women who had stuck by Jesus until the very end had no power at all, women had very little power at this time, or because no work could be done on the Sabbath, they had to wait until early Sunday morning to make things right, to give Jesus the <clears throat> burial. <coughs> Excuse me, one second. To give Jesus the burial that he deserved. Now, last week, we saw that these women, not the men, followed Jesus as he was buried. And so they knew where this tomb was. Now, they were in shock. 
These women knew that he was dead. Conquering death was a nice thought, uh, inspiring, but this was real life, and his body needed to be honored and taken care of. They, they loved him so much, and now he was gone. Even his disciples, who had been with him every day for three years, could not get their minds around this claim that he would rise after three days. He had told them clearly and specifically, I am going to rise after three days. Instead of hoping for that, they were basically stunned and brokenhearted and probably a little bit afraid. I mean, if the high priest and his crew could get to Jesus, they could easily get to his followers. Luke chapter 24, verse 1. Some of the greatest words we will ever read. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took spices and that they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away. And when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While this, they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood be beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee? The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. They remembered his words. And now these women begin to think, could it be? I mean, let's look at the facts. One, the body's gone. Two, these two gleaming guys, gleaming like lightning, are telling us that he has risen. And as a matter of fact, three, this is exactly what Jesus said was going to happen. Faith begins to build in these women as they come face to face with the fact that Jesus has risen from the dead. And slowly they begin to believe. We got to tell Peter and his crew. When they came back from the tomb, verse 9 of chapter 24 of Luke, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the others. So remember, you've got the other, some other followers. You've got the eleven. Judas is gone. You have the eleven and a few other followers. And the women were Mary Magdalena, uh, jo Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others with who had, who them and the others with them who told this to the apostles. Check this out, verse 11. These guys had been with Jesus for three years, but they did not believe the women because their words seemed like nonsense. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away wondering to himself what had happened. Peter, who Jesus opened his heart to as much as to anybody Peter still didn't get it he says they did not believe the women which by the way has been a problem for all of history uh, men have uh, for the most part had the power and women have often suffered at the hands of that power you know I learned early in marriage that women have a unique intuition. And I learned early to trust in Dee Dee's intuition. I could say all kinds of stuff, but Dee Dee, she has ear for the truth. She sees things that I don't see. I remember one time early in our ministry, uh, there was these um, beautiful gals in our church. They were sweet, very wonderful. And like they, I don't know, they just always ended up where I was, you know? And uh, one time uh, they came over to my father-in-law's house to hang out at the pool. And, and Didi called me aside. She goes, Robert, I just want you to watch out. I don't, trust, I don't trust what's happening there. And I said, okay, cool. And it turns out later, uh, after these folks had left the church, some things happened which indicated that there were some agendas there that really weren't healthy. And man... I learned early, uh, thank God for Didi. Thank God for a woman's intuition. Men, if you ain't learned to, to listen to that, ay, 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 you got some pain ahead. Um, 
got to relearn love and respect the gift that God has planted uh, in women. Now, here these women are the first witnesses to what Jesus specifically said would happen. And the disciples did not believe them. See, these women had been faithful followers of Jesus from the beginning. The Bible says that a group of women followed Jesus and the disciples around supplying um, resources for their needs, groceries and help. Uh, there is not one instance in any of the four Gospels where a woman is being hostile to Jesus. I think Jesus, people, women melted. Uh, their hearts melted when they were with Jesus because he looked at them as sisters and as daughters of the living God, not as objects of lust or of derision or second-class status. Jesus was like no one they had ever known. But their testimony was not enough. Peter had to check it out himself. He runs to the tomb, sees that it's empty. The body of Jesus is gone, but he's still not convinced. It's not enough to believe in an empty tomb. How much like us were the disciples? I mean, God can be faithful to us for 50 years. Since I started following Jesus almost 50 years ago, He has never failed me. He has been faithful. And yet how quickly we can forget and panic and, and when times get hard, when things get tough. Instead, instead, I think He calls us to trust. And. <clears throat> These disciples had listened and heard and seen what Jesus was saying, and yet they still weren't convinced. Here's three points I want to make about this incredible moment of resurrection. One, give yourself a break if believing all of the claims of Christ or of the Bible seem daunting at times. Give yourself a break if you are growing into that level of trust. You are, limi li you are human and living with, you know, with a fallen mind, still working through the process of gaining freedom from the strongholds that sin and unbelief have formed in you. If the disciples struggled with something so close to the event, I think we should give ourselves some grace. Give yourself some grace to be on a journey. Beating yourself up honors no one. Be kind even to yourself. Secondly, remember this, to place your trust in a risen Christ who has taken away your sins and has promised eternal life is a step of faith. It is a leap of faith. It is a surrender to what the Word of God says, but it is not a leap from rationality. It's not like saying, okay, you just got to believe that little green men came from Mars and believe that they're going to take you to another planet. So just believe. That, that is ridiculous. That is stupid. That is irrational. Faith, biblical faith is extremely rational. When the Lord blows in the Holy Spirit, He doesn't blow out our brains. It is rational to believe that something turned human history on its ear 2,000 years ago. That is rational. You can rationally look at history and something turned it all upside down 2,000 years ago. It is rational to believe that the resurrection of Jesus that the, that the disciples preached and eventually conquered the Roman Empire. That is rational. You can look at history and see that this gospel that was preached by the disciples, that Jesus rose from the dead, eventually conquered the Roman Empire within 300 years. It is rational to believe that the historic transmission and veracity of the Bible is an accurate witness. If, if you look at how the Bible came to us, it is rational to believe in its authenticity and its trustworthiness. This is not Looney Tunes or, or childish fables. And the fact that brilliant men and women like Pascal and Newton and C.S. Lewis and Helen Keller have believed it show that. Yet it is, a, it is a faith step to believe in the resurrection of Jesus, but it is not irrational. And I believe that it is the most rational thing a person can do. To believe in the resurrection of Jesus requires faith. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. You know, <clears throat> thirdly, Scripture says that when you believe, you are placed in Christ. You know, a type of Christ is the ark where Noah and his family and all two, a very kind of animal, were saved from the floods. 
Christ is our ark that saves us eternally. We are saved by being placed in Christ. It is not just believing in an empty tomb. Peter believed in an empty tomb. He saw the empty tomb, but he yet did not believe. But he did not come fully to faith in, to, to Christ till he saw Jesus and believed. But Jesus would later say to Thomas in John 20, 29, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. He's talking about you and me. Blessed are you who have believed even without seeing. You have believed based on the testimony of God's word. You have believed and you are saved. I remember, I, I've seen this happen so many times in my life. My dad had a heart attack. I think I've told you the story. I flew from Dallas to El Paso. I got there. He had tubes everywhere. And he prayed to, he said to me, he goes, I said, you want to pray, Dad? He goes, yes. I said, he goes, you want to ask Jesus into your heart? He goes, yeah. We prayed to receive Christ. When I opened my eyes, I saw a, one tear going down the side of his face. The next night, he had a turn for the worse, and he was gone. I remember when a friend of mine, Richard, Richard was a tough, rough guy. During a funeral, he looked up and received Christ. He believed. He was a convicted felon who did time with Charles Manson. Uh, knew Charles Manson. He placed his trust in Christ and his life was transformed. But I still talk to Richard. He's, he's slowly approaching the crossing over to be with Jesus. He's pretty old and pretty sick, but we still talk every couple weeks. And he loves Christ and he's going to see Jesus in the face. I remember when I placed my trust in Christ. I was 17. I just sold out completely uh, before my senior year of high school. And God changed my life. Because of that, I believe I will see my dad again. I'll see my father-in-law again. I'll see my friend Chris again, and I'll meet a bunch of people I've never met before over 2,000 years, and a 1,000 years before, looking forward to Christ, came to the Lord. John chapter 11, 25 says, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He says, he who believes in me will live even though he dies, and whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? It is Christ and Christ alone that leads us to eternal life. Do you believe this? I pray that you do. Now, if you're hearing this right now, and you've never made that leap of faith, I can help you. I've seen thousands of people do it, and it usually involves a prayer like this. Follow along with me right now if you've never done it, or if you just want to reaffirm your faith in Christ, just follow along with me. Repeat after me. Lord Jesus, I believe that when you died on the cross, you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead, conquering sin, death, and the grave for all time. Lord, come into my heart. I receive your forgiveness from this day forward. With your help, I will follow you the rest of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. It's the resurrection. He's risen from the dead, and because of that, we have no need to fear death, and we are going to be with him forever. I want to thank you for listening in. We have two more teachings uh, in the Gospel of Luke. Next week, we'll cover the road to Emmaus, and then the following week, the ascension of Jesus. So I want to thank you for your support. I want to thank you for your prayers, and I want to thank you for taking this journey with me. Let me pray a blessing, and we'll be done. The Lord bless you, and the Lord keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. Be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. In Jesus' name, amen. I love you, and I'll see you next week. Bye-bye.